All right, so when I was doing this course with uh, Dr. Rahman, we figured we'd, we'd pick a few topics that seem to be glossed over in, in standard trauma conferences. And since this conference is much more an educational conference for students, PA students, uh, residents and the like, I figured we'd pick something that was basic that sometimes we don't touch upon. And X-Fix is something that we all take for granted in orthopedics and orthopedics trauma. But how many times have we actually had a, a session on it? So we're bringing up Dr. Spence Reed, who is orthopedic traumatologist at Hershey. He's going to introduce his uh, panelists. I look forward to an exciting uh, session. Thank you. Okay, after lunch, worst time. Everybody's going to get that postprandial uh, thing going. I hope you had some coffee. We'll try to keep you awake. Uh, Matt, and, yeah, and uh, Irfan, come on up for us. So uh, I'm super happy to be here uh, with my panelists, uh, Matt Craig from Abington, Temple University. Uh, I've known Matt for a long time. I, I met Irfan Ahmed today, uh, my new friend uh, from Rutgers, uh, who's going to talk about upper extremity X-Fix. Susan Harding, uh, who's familiar to most of you, is parking her car as we speak, and she just texted me. She said that she'll be here uh, shortly. So we're going to. So I'm going to give a quick introduction about the topic, which is actually quite a broad topic, and then we're going to to jump in. Okay. Well, so external fixation is an incredibly useful tool that allows a surgeon to create a custom in instrument for each patient, for each individual application, and to do a certain task and. You know, how well this custom instru instrument works depends on how it's used and how well the surgeon understands how it's used. It's sort of like a musical instrument. You learn about it. You can use it in all sorts of different ways. Applications in trauma, temporary for fracture healing. Uh, this is, they're temporary where fracture healing is not intended. It's a soft tissue instrument for damage control or positioning a joint after internal fixation. It can be for definitive fixation for fracture union. Uh, relative stability, even absolute stability, uh, can be achieved with external fixation. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the biomechanics of unilateral and ring fixators drive how it responds in a given clinical situation, and the biomechanics that you achieve are up to how you put the frame together and how you choose the parts and how you put them together and how you apply them to the patient. Mechanics of unilateral fixation and ring fixation uh, are the tools you're going to use. Pin issues are going to come up. Uh, pin uh, external fixation involves pins going through the skin into the bone. Just remember that the stiffness of a pin is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So a five millimeter pin is two and a half times stiffer than a four millimeter pin, and a six millimeter pin is two times stiffer than a five millimeter pin. And then there's steel versus titanium. How do you put the pins in? Do you pre-drill? Pin design, is uh, HA coding important? We'll talk about all those issues. So this slide is probably the most important thing. You know, this, there's a spectrum, uh, external fixation occurs across the spectrum from temporary in which there's quite a bit of motion all the way down to control of finer and finer motion to the area where you can now get bone healing, okay, at the other end of the spectrum of external fixation. The spectrum uh, of external fixation, the lower extremity, Definitive external fixation is you get the stiffness to the point where you can have bone healing, where you're controlling strain to the point where you can now have either relative or absolute stability. You decide as a surgeon how you're going to construct the frame to achieve the biomechanics that you want at the fracture site. And you're now at the far end of the right in the lower corner of a stiff frame with very little motion. If you're going to have definitive fixation, you're going to have to control strain to allow that capillary network to cross the fracture gap and achieve union. And it's the same thing that Stefan Perrin taught us, and it's actually the same thing that Ilazarov taught us uh, with ring fixation as well. Okay, so with that, we're going to uh, bring up Matt Craig to talk about damage control in the lower extremity. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Again, the uh, after lunch crowd, thank you. Uh, I'm Matthew Craig, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic trauma surgeon at um, Abington Hospital. I'll also make my way to Torresdale every now and again. So uh, the, the charge was uh, you know, dips for damage control, lower extremity, uh, kind of focusing on, well, there's the damage control or orthopedics. What is that? Well, there's the damage control of orthopedics. They, they described it in 1993. Stabilizing orthopedic injuries to the patient's overall physiology can improve. It's resuscitative. We actually help in the resuscitative process of trauma patients. 
Well, what's that focus on? Controlling hemorrhage, management of soft tissues, achieving provisional fracture stability, avoiding insults to the patient. And then around here, sometimes you get busy. Man, I'd love to take care of that patient tonight, but I got three more that I got to take care of. Sometimes you have to do some damage control. You know, any, any port in the storm, park people on a frame for a little bit, and then be able to come back later. Management, not only of multiple, Patients with multiple injuries, you may have multiple injured patients. Um, train derailments happen, that have happened here locally. Um, management of injuries prior to a trauma, transfer to, to another center. People here may not be at uh, you know, trauma centers themselves. Some of this talk is what I do, and then some of the perspectives I like to take when I give it is what all I, how do I want to receive the patient? Here's what I'd like you to do. If you don't need to help me, just please don't hurt me. And then, you know, management of patients to another uh, surgery. There's the multiply injured patient, their physiologic unstable, chest injuries, their brain injuries, or a mass casualty situation. So one thing to think about is when you're going to put an X fix on somebody in the lower extremity sort of uh, temporarily, are they, is the patient ready for a definitive procedure? If they're not, their skin's not ready, they're not physiologically ready, X fix is a good idea. Am I the one to treat definitively? If you're the one who wants to treat this whole patient from start to finish, go for it but please don't start half the surgery and then send them to me, just send them to me as soon as possible. Is there enough time for a definitive procedure? These things happen that you say, oh my gosh, there's, this guy needs four hours of surgery between my schedule, the OR schedule, everything going on, this happens. We're gonna have to do something temporary today, and come back and fight another day. I call it that three-legged stool, patient availability, OR availability, and surgery availability. So what does an X-Fix do? It's gonna improve alignment, centrally locate the talus in the lower extremity. Uh, the tail is under the tibia. This is pretty much around the ankle. Um, you can get some slight joint, joint distraction, which is okay. So four things I kind of looked at with the lower extremity really was the external fixation of the femur, external fixation of the knee, tibia, and ankle. So really two long bones or a joint. My thoughts. So that was sort of the little, my charge was, what are my thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, first of all, keep it simple. An X-Fix is actually expensive. You start looking at all the pins and bars that you put on and then take off five days later and the plates and screws that you put in, look at the costs, and you'll find out that the X-Fix was far more expensive. Um, if you're doing damage control, and that was the charge for the talk, you get in, get out. This is not a four-hour ankle X-Fix. I've heard of those things, that it confuses me. Um, when you do the operation for an external fixer, try to plan the definitive operation if you can, where's my incisions gonna be, and then go away from those things. Um, it's sometimes, Difficult to do that, not to think how I think before you put on an X-Fix, but just keep that in mind. Put your pins where your, the other incisions are not gonna be. I like to show my work. I think I just saw Dr. Harding work, walk in. There's two different perspectives. I like to show it off. I put pin dressings only and let everyone see the pins and bars. I will tighten the clamps down as hard as I can. And I wanna scare the rep. I've never broken an X-Fix pin. Well, not currently. That I clamp them down as hard as I can because I don't like loose external fixers. I think a rigid frame actually is very helpful. Uh, it drives me nuts when they're loose. Uh, oh, wait a minute, go back one here. Did I hit, uh, there was one last point there. There you go. Um, and then, by the way, please let your ex fix get wet in the shower. I don't know why this just came up recently. Some, somebody told somebody that they couldn't get their frame wet in the shower. It's okay. I don't really understand why you can't do that. So if you send them home with an ex fix, they can get it wet. So when you get into the femur, this is an unusual frame to put on. Most people are stabilized within 24 hours in an intermedial nail, but if you find yourself having to put an uh, X-Fix on a femur, two half pins above the fracture, two half pins below the fracture, placing it lateral, anterior lateral, as you can see here. It's not as easy as you think. Oh, we'll just put a frame on the femur. Those are the ones that take several hours when, if they could survive several hours of your X-Fix, why didn't they survive several hours of a nail? My argument is, provide them definitive treatment. So traction here may be a, a better idea than if you don't know how to put an X-Fix on, consider traction. Um, consider definitive plan. Don't expect a perfect reduction. You don't need to spend six hours trying to make, make it perfect when this frame is for you to get in, get out. And then with a patient who's framed, let's say they have bilateral femur fractures, who's gonna need multiple studies, you now have a patient who's not in traction, and that would be the reason to do it, so that somebody then can be moved around for multiple studies. Um, because the patient can't ask to come in and out of traction. So it's like traveling traction. We get into uh, external fixation of the knee. Same thing, two half pins in the femur. Dr. Reed kind of mentioned in the drilling versus no drilling. I will um, put in self-drilling pins into the femur. I will pre-drill my tibial pins. Um, some people do, some people don't. That's just my habit. 
So interlateral pins in the femur, intermedial to intermedial pins in the, uh, in the tibia. Also the idea of keeping it simple and con considering your definitive treatment plan, this frame you see here, I guess you guys can't, well, you can see my mouse, good. Um, trying to get my tibial pins fairly distal. We don't have x-rays to show you this, but this is sort of a very proximal um, two-part bicondylar tibial plateau fracture. Um, then I want this as far down as possible. It's also a medial pin. Most of my plate's gonna be lateral if I'm gonna plate it. So I, I joke around with the resins a lot. You know, I have never seen a pins too distal, right? That doesn't really exist, that doesn't happen. What you see is pins too proximal, and then I get angry, or annoyed, not really angry. So try to keep it simple, definitive treatment plan. If you've gone to the operating room for compartment syndrome, don't muck around putting a frame on. Do the fasciotomy first, just do the fasciotomy. Then those incisions are where they need to be. Then you start putting your pins in around that. Do the, ne the, uh, the, the wound back first, putting on your negative pressure wound therapy. It's really challenging to put it on around a frame. So I do the fasciotomy. I'll um, make, take care of that, do the soft tissues, put my back on, and then start putting my pins on. I'm kind of doing that last. The idea is to get length alignment, soft tissue stability, that sort of metastable reduction. Um, you're not going to make it perfect. And this came up at some point, it was just a thought. These things are not considered MRI safe, according to the FDA. They're called MRI conditional, and it's a four hour conversation with somebody that maybe they will, maybe they won't get an MRI. If for some reason, somebody somehow, somewhere needs an MRI, think about getting it first. If it's a brain MRI, if it's a knee MRI, if you Google, Striker wall chart for radiologists. There's a document that'll come up that'll explain everything about an X-Fix to a radiologist that they need to know all that gobbledygook. So it's one of those things that'll come up. It's my thoughts. Try to do it first. I don't usually though. Um, if you get into the tibial shaft, this could be called traveling traction. To me, that's what you see here. It doesn't show up as well, but a transverse pin in the proximal tibia, transverse pin in the heel, just two, two um, pins down, or two bars down the side. It's as simple as I can get. You're putting them in lateral to medial in the tibia. You're putting them in medial to lateral in the calcaneus. Again, keeping it simple. Um, if this is the way I'd like to receive it. If I need to revise this later, this is the most basic frame I can revise. That would be great. Um, do your soft tissue work for the X-fix. The bars will get in the way. And then if you're going to nail a tibial shaft, the literature says to nail that within two weeks. Here's a lady who came in, just a low energy, she's an older patient, fell from standing height, low energy trauma, this is not high energy trauma, huge serous angular uh, fracture blister there, ooh, I'm not going to do anything with that, this could get worse pretty quickly, whoops, end up putting her into traveling traction, transverse pin up top, transverse pin down below in the calcaneus, it all defervesces, um, I don't routinely un unroof the blisters, that's a whole other conversation, and then when then she came back, um, within two weeks and skin looked great and we ended up putting a nail in. Getting into the ankle, same thing, just temporary stabilization of soft tissues. This is a nice frame that somebody put on. Uh, this particular one I received from somebody else, but two pins in the tibia, nice and high, pin in the calcaneus, frame around it. Tips and tricks for the lower extremity, get the patient all the way to the end of the bed. I don't use a Jackson table because I don't like that big post at the end of the bed. These are, the charge was my thoughts. My thoughts are, I don't want a Jackson table. I want the patient all the way to the end of the bed for an ankle so I can be 270 degrees around the end of the bed. Bone foam ramp, elevate the leg so I can get a nice uh, lateral. I put the tourniquet on, but I rarely use it. I have it there just in case. See, I'm from the opposite side. Two hat pins in the tibia, medial pins. Can they be too proximal? I don't think they could be too proximal. You could probably have some issues, but I'd like them more proximal if I can. You're pinning the calcaneus. Get into good bone, or posterior and distal. Um, I prefer not to use what I call the cluster clamps, whether it's a, just a cluster or they're clustering things together. This is an example of part of that cluster clamp. I usually put in just pin, pin, bar, bar, make it all work. This is a pin that I re re received somewhere else. You want rigidity, however you obtain that is the way to go. Keep bars away from the skin in case for swelling. Here's your kickstand with the dollar sign. This is just an example of what I mean about a kickstand is here. This keeps it off the bed. This person came in with a kickstand, if you guys are into this kind of stuff. Put your kickstands bar to bar, not pin to bar, because then the, the little clamps will rotate around the skinny pins. You put them bar to bar, there's less for them to rotate around. That's what's going on here, is that they're actually bar to bar. I do it sometimes. Ah, screw that one up. All right, that was my quick x fix talk. Thank you very much.
<laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. And uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Ahmed, who's going to talk to us about damage control in the uh, in the upper extremity. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, being here. Thank you for calling me. I just wanted to give a few things with um, upper extremity. I think it's a lot more forgiving uh, than the lower extremity. I think the blood supply is a lot better, so the indications of when to do an uh, X-fix is also less. I think we're moving away from doing uh, does the patient really need it? Um, I also think um, that the main issues which you have with upper extremity X-fix is where the nerves are, and if you avoid those, um, and then you want to make sure you don't put in the pins where the tendons may cross, because if you lose a little bit of motion, if your toes can't move properly, and if you get a little bit stiff in the lower extremity, you can get away with a lot more if you're not able to have full function of your fingers, wrist to some extent, I think that causes the patient uh, a lot more trouble. So I'm just gonna focus on that. Uh, uh, I think my colleagues before me went over a few things and I had some idea they might do that, so I'm gonna breeze by a few things of just you know what the indications are. As we mentioned, can be definitive, temporary. It can be used for arthrodesis, infections, um, limb length uh, as well. I know this is mainly a trauma talk, but these are things which you can use X-Fix for. It's reasonably quick application, uh, 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 minimally invasive, more in the lower extremity. The upper extremity, I think, especially in the humerus, is try to make a bigger decision, especially if, uh, incision if you're not sure uh, or if you haven't done enough of those. And disadvantages, you can over-distract um, stability is inadequate, you can get infections, so they can be mechanical, they can be biological, it can call malu uh, malunions and nonunions. The main mechanism in the upper extremity is to get distraction to some extent and ligamental taxes. Again, you can tolerate a little bit more uh, alignment, which is not perfect, more so in the upper extremity because you have a lot more mobile shoulder, elbow, so you can get away with it a lot more compared to the lower extremity. Uh, treatment is, you know, each fracture is based on its uh, personality. Avoid burning any bridges. Dr. Uh, Craig mentioned keep the pins away from the surgical site area. Keep pins in safe zones. And, and this is what he was talking about. Sometimes if you're not sure how to manage a patient and you might need to do an X-fix, as Dr. Craig said, you know, allow, put the X-fix on so you can transfer it to a trauma center and at least know to try and put the pins away from where uh, the final incision would be made. Stiffness, again, I'll just read through this quickly. Pin diameter, obviously, uh, that's something we've talked about. Um, where you put the, you can double stack it for uh, getting more stiffness. Um, you can have it in multi-planes. Uh, pin spread, it's, it's better if it's closer to the fracture site, but that's where you usually end up making your incision, where you might put your final plate. And then moving the bar closer, uh, I thought this was a thing. I, I transitioned from general surgery to orthopedic as third year. And then when I asked how close do you want the bar, they all said MKD. And I was like, oh, that's something which was said everywhere. And then when I went for fellowship, they're like, what does that mean? It basically means minimum curl X distance. The minimum distance you need to be able to pass a curl X underneath, that's how close you want it. Um, so. I just thought that was a thing which was in the textbook, which clearly wasn't. Guidelines for diameter, uh, uh, humerus, usually, obviously, as you go down the arm, you look, go for uh, smaller and smaller pins. Uh, just a rough idea of what you should use. And now, general principles, I only added my part because there's just one or two parts in that. You know, make general, big, uh, large incisions in the humerus. My part would be, people try to do hinge X fi fixes I'm, there might be some fans of that here. I'm not a fan of those. Uh, I don't think you do get a lot out of them, and they're really pain to put in. Uh, and we've used less, even more so in the upper extremity because of internal stabilizers, just you know, internal elbow stabilizer. There's a dorsal spanning plate. So I think doing X-fix in the upper extremities, we're going to less and less. I'm, I'm basically a hand surgeon probably I'm just saying, except for that x-ray, I won't talk too much about those things, so don't worry about that. Uh, you can use your pin and to bar clamp to get an idea where to make the incision and how large, and that 
specifically in the humerus, and I'll show a slide, you can just place that on the skin and say, okay, my pins are gonna go here, and then make an incision the whole length of that clamp. Instead of making a smaller incision and going bigger, if you're gonna place two pins together, just combine that and make one larger inc incision, and don't over distract. Humerus, again, radial nerve, where is it? Um, I like to identify it if possible, but at least you should know where the safe zones are and try to put all the pins in from lateral. Sometimes you cannot, I get that. But, and then ask yourself, does the patient really need an X-fix uh, or not? So these are the AO guidelines, just, you know, uh, uh, you know, it should be, near, uh, sorry, inserted near the deltoid insertion in the middle third. That's the best site to do it. And if you have to place more distally, insert from the posterior lateral dis direction. So this, you know, you have your axillary nerve here, and everyone's got a chromium you can palpate, five to seven centimeters, mark out. You don't really need to a lot of times, but you can put X-fix pins up here. It's a little bit uh, difficult to go all the way down to bone because you've got a large deltoid, but if needed, it can be done. The best place is in the middle third where it says 50%, right where the deltoid inserts. Round about that area, your nerve is Posteriorly, um, your brachialis comes up, but there's, you can, this is probably the best place to place the pin. You have to be a little careful. You can measure out that, oh, the, the nerve is not gonna be at 14 centimeters and it comes across at 12, so I'm measuring. If you have a fracture and you're shortened four or five, uh, three or four centimeters, you can, you can be completely off compared to where, uh, where you wanna be. So if you palpate, uh, where you think the uh, deltoid is inserting, right about there is the best place to place the, uh, the pins. The other place is, is distally. You can place a, uh, the pin up to six centimeters from the lateral epicondyle. Again, you have to be careful of their shortening. But at that point, the nerve has gone anterior. So if you want to put pins here, they better to come from the, the posterior lateral area because by that time, your nerve has gone more uh, anteriorly. So that's the most important thing, and make a larger incision spread down to bone. If I'm anywhere close to this area where I think the nerve I'll be crossing, I always try to identify the nerve. I know that's another thing we, we like to see where the nerve is, whereas um, you know my colleagues in trauma, they're like, nope, I think the nerve is gonna be there. I don't wanna be anywhere close to that to just move that away. But I like to identify where the, where the nerve is. And this is what I meant. You can put this clamp right down where you think it's going to go. Your incision should be marked from one end to the other and make the whole incision to get down um, to, uh, to place your pins. The ulna is a lot easier. Uh, it's rare to do ulna X-fix. Um, you do see it just for an isolated ulna fracture. It's usually to span the elbow. The dorsal part is quite easy palpable. Uh, and if you pronate the arm, it actually moves your extensor tendons away radially and makes it more easily palpable and also less likely to snag those muscles so you can start moving it. Uh, I think it's good to do that on a hand table because you have some idea where the patient is going to lie when they're in bed because obviously if you're doing an X-fix, either uh, it's damage control, they're in the ICU, they're not gonna move and you don't wanna put the the pins straight dorsal or medial because it's difficult to have the patient lie on the bed. So if you've got the hand table and they're out, one, the arm is pronated, which is how you want it, and you can put the pins more dorsal laterally so when the arm is adducted, it's not gonna cause any issues uh, with them. Um, in the radius, proximally, uh, you know, again, you can put a pin anywhere and sometimes you have to if you, if you uh, dissect down, but usually it's inserted in the mid shaft or distally, uh, and that's usually to prone uh, to uh, cross the wrist. And I think the easiest way uh, to do it is here. If this is your uh, the mid shaft of the radius, your radial sensory nerve rise almost directly lateral. This is your second compartment and this is your fourth compartment coming across. So the best side to put the pins in is dorsolateral because you're right between ECRL, ECRB, 
and your abductor pulse is longest than EPB. So in the mid-shaft dorsal radial, you're away from the radial nerve, which is more radi right over here, and this is in the mid-shaft the best place to put uh, your um, uh, pins in. Again, if you're not sure, make a longer incision here as well. As you come to the distal radius, <clears throat> this is where you can easily snag the tendons and then post-op the patients are not gonna be able to remove the fingers. The best place here where there's less tendons crossing over is just proximal to Lister's tubercle. Um, if you're not sure, because sometimes they can be fractured here, the arm is too swollen. If you divide, divide your distal forearm in thirds, so one third, two third, three, and, and obviously the third part, it's at the junction between your radial third and middle third. That's roughly where Lister's is. So if you make a one centimeter incision right at the junction between your radial third and middle third, that's roughly where Lister's tubercle is going to be, and you can put an X-fix pin over there, avoid the DRUJ. Uh, and metacarpals, uh, most of the time you're putting in into the index finger, but you can have to put everywhere else in. Um, so as the extensor tendons come from a slightly more ulnar position, for the index finger, it's better to put the uh, pins in going from a radial direction because you'll miss the tendon and in the small finger, it's better to put it from an ulnar direction uh, because that's the best way to, uh, uh, you'll uh, end up missing the tendon. Try to put it more proximally if possible. The, the metacarpal shaft is quite thin and if you're a little off and then you have to drill again, now you've got a metacarpal fracture. So yeah, try to place them a little bit more uh, proximally. So I'm just gonna go in two seconds, just not two seconds, maybe two minutes over this. It's rare to see a clavicle I had one of my partners who, who actually did a clavicle X-fix. I've never done one, but it can be done. And he did this for a non-union, uh, gave a little uh, hardware break, put an X-fix on, and then ended up doing a, a spacer uh, and healed it that way. This is a case I had for my boards. I, I called Dr. Rahman and I said, this came in and can you review this with me? It's been chosen. It's an open fracture. Uh, I took it to the OR, middle of the night, I did an X-fix on. See, this is what I meant by being shortened, so you have to be careful when you measure. And he listened to me, he went over everything, and then he said, why did you X-fix it? And I think I was, you know, in my second year, I said, well, it was not a line and it was open and I didn't want to fix it. He goes, yeah, but why did you X-fix it? And I didn't really have a great answer. I mean, I aligned it well, but he's like, was the patient really sick? He's like, no, he was, he was okay. But that's what I mean. A lot of times you can just leave these, right? If you just put it in a splint and then fixed it later on, it probably would have been okay. And, and I, I, I got that now, so I'm doing a lot less of these. Uh, Germany surgeon? Yeah. Would you want me to X fix it or just wash it out, put it in a splint, send it to you? Just wash it out and uh, put a splint yeah. on. I think well, it'll be fine. What if it was going to be an unknown period of time till transfer? Did you hurt the patient with the fixator? Uh, it ended up did getting a radial nerve palsy, but then it came okay. back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And I made right. her, okay. you know, large incision because again, for a second year, I'm like, I'm going to make a huge incision. And um, there, there's reasons to put the frame on, but it's, they're not absolute. You, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying it was but open fracture, middle question. of the night. It's not, so, I should put an X-fix on. You better it have just, an answer for the board examiner, that's all. <laughs> it just came. Um, uh, and then, again, hinged external fixator. There's a pin that has to go on the medial side, lateral side. You can get the ulnar nerve. It never works well. Uh, I've used it for chronic elbow dislocations, but it just, it just doesn't. I'm just going to, because I think we're short on time, uh, this is where uh, an X-fix was placed distally, just proximal to Lister's to span this. And that was done because this patient could not get plates at that time. I think a dorsal spanning plate, if I can, I'm much more likely to put that on than an external fixator because the patient doesn't have pins sticking out. They can bear weight on it right away. And you want to look at the carpus, make sure your radiocarpal and intercarpal distance. This might be even a little over distracted because you can get them, uh, give them CRPS. And then of course you can put it in the, uh, the metacarpals as well. But I'm, I'm, I guess, Matt, you'll probably be sending me those. Uh. 
And then other applications are you can use them for metacarpal lengthening, which we use in, in the hand, so end, end up doing that. And if you have a hand compartment syndrome, it helps to give a, uh, because they get a very severe adduction contracture. So you wanna put that in uh, to prevent uh, adduction of the first web space. Great, great, thanks. Uh, well, well, Susan comes up, quick question. So where in the, uh, in the uh, upper extremity would you use it definitively? Definitive X fix in the upper extremity. I mean, if I can avoid it, I won't, but I think you can probably for the uh, wrist fractures I can because I think if you get enough traction, the, it actually comes together the articular surface reasonably well. Um, so I, I, I've used X fix for that. I haven't had a patient that I've used X fix definitively for. Um, distal humerus or a humerus. I mean, unfortunately, the one or two which I thought we might, that patient was so unwell, they ended up okay. not making it. But I think in the distal radius, it actually works reasonably well. Great, thanks. Okay. Susan? Susan is here, and you're gonna talk about definitive fixation, uh, both unilateral and ring uh, fixation. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again to Sakov and all the team for inviting me. Okay, so um, we're talking today about um, definitive fixation using the external fixator and where there may be some indications. Uh, there has been over the years an evolution of the concept of external fixation and when used correctly, it can be a very nice adjunct to your, in, your definitive fixation protocols. You have to be careful about things like distracting aggressively through the fixator frame. Um, and other like traps that you can fall into. Um, we want to talk about some of that today and get an idea not only about standard fixation but also um, hybrid fixators and uh, Elizaroff type techniques, thin wire frames. I um, have done about 20 thin wire frames in my career so we got one of the experts here on the panel. I'm going to defer to Spence for some of that conversation. Um, I think that most people in the audience on a day-to-day -day basis are going to be dealing more with the standard frame, so I'd like to concentrate on how that um, can be um, utilized effectively in a more definitive fixation protocol. All right, so there's a, you know, things are evolving, like I said, and there's a lot of literature out there now on the use of external fixation as more definitive treatment for long bones, certainly. Um, which is a kind of a new concept, at least in the adult. Um, it's kind of like old stuff is new and the new stuff is old again because initially when frames first came out, there was a lot of use for that and then it became more of a provisional system and now it's evolving again back into some more definitive options for care. Um, I want to talk a little bit about first the application of the frame. I'm, I'm breaking this talk up into three sections, like the application of the frame, the maintenance of the frame, and then the removal of the frame. And what kind of things you need to be thinking about um, if you're planning on using your frame as definitive treatment. So first of all, you have to practice really good technique when you're building your frame during the application phase. Um, you, you have to have in your mind, what is my mission statement with this frame? How am I utilizing this particular construct to act like a plate and screws, and why am I doing it in this particular patient with this particular fracture? Um, at the same time as you're figuring that out yourself, you also have to kind of, con um, kind of ease the patient into the idea of definitive frame treatment, because it can be a little um, dissuading to patients sometimes. They're, they, they are more comfortable in many cases with surgical incisions that are closed, and once the stitches comes out, it doesn't look so scary, and dealing with the frame on a longer term basis can be daunting to them. So you have to kind of prep your patient for that idea of a more long term frame um, system. Uh, take the time that you need, if you're, if you're, again, this is using the frame as a definitive treatment, take the time that you need to make sure you get an accurate reduction. Just because you're utilizing a frame for some of the reasons we're gonna talk about in a minute, um, to hold everything still doesn't mean 
that you're in a damage control situation and that you're just trying to get things provisionally aligned. If you're using the frame definitively, treat it the same way you would with an open reduction internal fixation. Now, of course, maybe one of the reasons you're using the frame is because the soft tissues aren't that great. So you have to take that into account and find that balance. But don't just assume that because you're using the frame, you kind of have carte blanche to kind of get it just OK. All right? And I'll show you a couple examples of that. Um, you need to be really careful in your technique. This is always true no matter whether you're using the frame for short term or long term. But if you are using it for long term, your risk of pin tract issues goes up, obviously. So it's your responsibility to minimize that as much as possible. So preventing, for example, thermal necrosis as much as possible by pre-drilling your pins and irrigating. Even I irrigate even while I'm pre-drilling, all right? Let alone never try to just put the pin in uh, directly. And it's maybe really old, really sick lady um, with really bad osteoporosis in the femoral condylar region. You could maybe get away with that, but for shaft stuff, I would not recommend it. And especially since, again, here we're talking about non-emergent uses of the frame, be meticulous about how you insert your pins. Um, you also want to build a construct that's pretty robust. You have to be really um, planning ahead that this is going to need to last this person a long time. If this is going to be your definitive treatment, make sure your construct reflects that. So here's an example of a patient that I had um, in recently in my practice. Uh, so her follow-up's a little short, but she's doing okay. She's a 47-year-old female. She's got multiple medical problems, obesity, non incident dependent di diabetes. And the biggest one is some pretty significant schizophrenia. She is, lives in the outside world in a group home. She engages with people. She's a nice lady, very um, you know, um, receptive to our care, not argumentative or anything like that, but not able to comply with instructions very well. And a, a real challenge to take care of her. She had this really bad uh, distal tibia fracture, as you can see, intraarticular uh, Plafond uh, comminution, uh, high energy pilon fracture. So, you know, a lot of times we would think, okay, X fixed till the soft tissues are ready, and then ORIF. But that was not a good option for this lady. She was poorly compliant, like I said, with her follow up. There was just a lot of reasons, both medically and social, psychosocial, that I did not feel comfortable with that plan. Here's just some CAT scan to let you know that it was a true intraarticular fracture. And uh, you know, as such, a real challenge as to how we were going to meet this lady's needs most appropriately. So I did this, um, I, and all these decisions are totally up for conversation. And that's the greatest thing about trauma orthopedics, right? Like our joints colleagues, they're like, they're like bakers. I always tell my partners, you guys are like bakers. You know, one cup flour, boom, one quarter teaspoon sugar, right, boom, like that, and. We're like chefs, you know, you, you taste it a little and you put a little more salt in and then you taste it a little more. Because every single time I do a case, it's a little bit different maybe. And that's the greatest thing about trauma. And joints guys just go like that about it, you know, they're not interested. <laughs> so in this particular case, even though this is not normally how I would treat this fracture, I think it was the best thing for this lady. We got her well aligned in terms of the articular reduction. And at one point in time, she did have some thin wires in here, some pins. But even burying them under the skin, uh, you know, she was messing with them. She was picking at them, da 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 da. So we had to end up taking them out. So here's where she was for most of her treatment time. And it was a fairly good articular reduction, even though, you know, she has some free fragments that aren't quite aligned there. But not, not, the joint is obviously what matters. And here she is, six months out from her injury, two months from the removal of X-Fix. She was, again, non-compliant the whole time, walking on the thing. Every time she came in, I was just like, ah. But um, we were able to maintain at least a reasonable ankle joint. Is she, does she have arthritis? Yes, yeah, she's got arthritis. I mean, this is like fighting a war to get this lady to follow instructions. And so it's not going to be the best outcome. But her talus is concentrically reduced underneath the ankle mortise, okay, within the ankle mortise. And um, she has like a dome, a ball in a dome. And so if she does need something done down the road, an option for ankle fusion in a more limited, minimally invasive fashion is out there now. If you're completely like scrambled eggs and you don't even have axial alignment um, or, or some semblance of a mortise, that option is never as effective. So I think we did 
pretty good by her giving all of her limitations and restrictions. I do not think, oh, heavy, heavy smoker too. I do not think she would have done well with uh, uh, in, in open reduction and in internal fixation. So this is an example of one option there uh, in terms of choosing your, your battles. Uh, now when you're maintaining your frame, there's some additional tips and pearls that we can pay attention to. One is just pay attention. All right, pay attention to your frame. Don't let it just disappear out into the world and not really pay it a lot of mind because, oh, it's just a frame. Attend to the pin sites. Make sure the patient's doing that. If the patient isn't doing that, enlist family members, friends, um, uh, hot, get somebody on board from home health care or something like that so that the pin sites are cared for. Whatever your treatment plan is for pin sites, whether you keep them covered most of the time or you do actual pin care, and you know, there's arguments on both sides of that fence. Um, don't be afraid to make some changes midstream and either supplement or adjust your construct. All right? It doesn't have to just stay the same way that it is if the construct isn't working. And continue to coach your patient through the ordeal because it is, again, it's kind of tough for these people. Um, you have to be willing to change lanes. And if this is not working, you need to convert to an internal fixation model in some cases. But again, these would be patients already kind of partitioned out and, and selected for definitive external fixation because internal fixation wasn't a good choice for them for whatever reason. So that's a discussion to be had with the patient and your colleagues and get whatever input you can get um, along the way. This is a gentleman who's 48 years old. He's insulin dependent, diabetes, poorly controlled, again, poorly compliant, trying to walk on everything. He likes to skydive. It's the same adrenaline thing probably as walking on his um, shattered midfoot. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that part. I'd rather skydive, but um, yeah. So he's just not compliant at all. And by the time he gets to uh, my hands, this fracture, which was all minimally displaced through this midfoot, is now widely gap navicular, subluxation of his midfoot, and uh, a lot of comminution. He already has wounds on his foot, not directly over the fractures. They weren't open fractures, but the wounds on the foot are not small. He's tr struggling to heal them, and, I, and he's a big puffball because he won't stop whatever he's doing. So not a good candidate, again, for open reduction internal fixation. And you can see by the time we got him to the OR, even a few days after that picture, he's already gapped even more. Um, oops, sorry. This is what I did. It's not purely an external fixator, obviously, but I want to use this as an example of where you can do some sort of a hybrid type approach. Um, you know, I, I fixed internally through minimally invasive percutaneous techniques with some screws and pins through the major fracture fragments, particularly trying to restore that navicular. And then what does that frame do? What that frame does is it helps to maintain my midfoot medial length, because this fracture is constantly trying to fall into varus, just like all the rest of the world. And those screws and those tiny little pins are not going to fight against that effectively enough. So the frame is maintained during the entire length of his treatment, and that's why it kind of fits this talk a little bit, because that whole idea of using your frame alone with nothing else is not really what we're suggesting. We're suggesting to incorporate your frame in unique or novel ways and, you, and carry it through a good portion of the treatment plan, perhaps the entire treatment plan, and this is another example of that, okay? A, a kind of a combination technique. So that frame is critically important in maintaining this medial column here, and uh, he's, he's fairly fresh, so we'll see how he does, but at least his wounds are healing and his pin tracks are clean. All right, removing the frame, you have to be mindful again about that. You have to prepare the patient for multiple possibilities because sometimes you'll take your frame off and not be satisfied with your um, alignment or stability and you'll need to either reapply the frame or do some additional internal fixation if you're taking another pathway at that point in time. So always have full conversation with the patients about these possibilities so you don't get yourself trapped. Um, I recommend, when you've used the frame more definitively, I recommend removing it in the operating room all the time. Sometimes frames can come off in the office setting, there's no doubt about that. But what you're trying to decide is, have I effectively treated this problem yet or not? Because if you haven't, you need to do due diligence and maybe take another route. So um, I like to take it off in the OR and really get a good feel for not only how the imaging looks, but how the limb behaves mechanically once the frame is off. 
So you still are maintaining your mission statement of I'm going to use an X fix definitively for this guy, but you're flexible and you keep that open-minded uh, approach as you move through the entire treatment uh, protocol. This is a fellow uh, who obviously has, he had a very bad ankle fracture um, and then he had, his, his buddy ran over his foot when they were backing out of the driveway. And so he has crush injury to his foot, a lot of bad um, metatarsal fractures, some instability, kind of, sort of, through the list frank area there. He's 87 going on 110, but he's got this hat that says, make my ankle great again, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> and uh, so in an effort to get him stabilized, initially I provided him a frame like this, attached to the frame that spanned his ankle as well. But the ankle skin improved, and I was able to go ahead and fix the ankle internally, and that was good because it needed it. The foot may not be perfect, but for this guy, it's great. He is running around the town of Cape May Courthouse, my new home away from home, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and he is uh, very, very comfortable. So again, proper patient selection, proper frame construct, and also being willing to switch gears and do a little hybrid stuff as you need to is probably the best advice I could give you when you're considering long-term frame stabilization. So once, what once was old is new again. These are all of the things we discussed, discussed, and these techniques keep coming back over and over again as you play the game of orthopedic trauma. And that's, again, the beauty of it, in my opinion. Uh, some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, or end. Uh, Hahnemann. <laughs> All right, very good, thanks. Thanks very much. Five minutes, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, a, a, a quick comment, uh, and then I have some, first of all, questions from the audience. Uh, anybody have any, any burning, everybody's still awake? Everybody when you need coffee? Okay, good, hey, hold that thought. Uh, my comment is that um, one of the things in my practice that's made a big difference for definitive external fixation is the use of HA-coated pins. Uh, it's, it's dramatically reduced pin loosening, uh, reduced pin infections, and so I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, either unilateral or particularly ring fixation is the use of HA-coated pins. That's my comment. My questions are, uh, Matt, you made the, the comment that, uh, you know, you put an external fixture on a tibia with a plan to come back and nail it, and you hopefully do it within two weeks. What do you do when it's past two weeks, when it's three weeks, and what, what do you do when you still want to nail it? Uh, I'd probably go back to that paper that described what they did. So uh, I believe the answer would be to take off the frame, you'd breathe the pin sites, you wash everything out, put them in a splint. You could also convert to a different frame in a different location, trying to bypass everywhere we're gonna, we're gonna operate. If it was a frame only on the tibia, you could extend, and you needed this frame for whatever reason, you could extend up to the femur, down to the ankle, do something different to allow your pin sites to seal off and be, sterile or quasi-sterile uh, prior to operating. Okay. Yeah. Susan, any, any thoughts on that topic? Any feel the same way? No, I agree the same with way? that. Yeah, the, the extension of the frame to a safer area is always a good thought to keep in the back of your mind, and you've got to have clean pin sites. That's critical. Okay. Uh, in, in my world, it's partly driven by what the pin sites look like. I mean, if you've got a bad-looking pin, that's probably a problem. But if they all look pristine and you've got an A host, you know, you've got a good host, I'll put them on three to four days of broad spectrum oral antibiotics and, and I'll do a one step exchange. As long as it's an A host and all the pins look good, that's a controversial thing. Yeah, yeah, Susan, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just add one more thing about pin sites, because it's so important. Um, one of the things that was mentioned was, you know, um, what order to put your construct together in. And one thing that I like to do is if it's a really gnarly, broken, um, open fracture, um, if the, if this, Soft tissues are very dirty, very contaminated, not just a little poke hole, but a real honest to goodness mess. Then I usually put my pins in, I cover that with like Ioband or something at the initial prep and drape. Then I put my pins in, and then I do the IND and debridement because I don't like the idea of all that debris kind of washing all over the drapes and all over the leg, and then theoretically, driving some of that in as you're inserting your pins. Your hands are dirty, you know, even if you change your gloves, the drapes are dirty. So I put in the pins, and then I go back to the wound and do my formal debridement. Then I add the frame, and I, that's worked good for me, so it's something to consider. And the other comment I'd like to make is, so every, actually everybody mentioned it, uh, but this thermal necrosis issue, 
you know, you, once, you, once you create a thermal injury to the bone from the insertion of a pin, there's no, there's no recovery. It's, the bone's dead. You know, you, it, it's going to be a dead bone. It's going to be loose, potentially get infected. So thermal necrosis when you're putting in pins and pre-drilling and Susan mentioned water cooling, you know, particularly for definitive frames, I, I think is, can't be overemphasized. My next question is, so let's talk about, actually for both upper extremity, lower extremity, uh, and let me give an example of a plateau fracture. It's been spanned. Uh, the frame got sent to you from elsewhere, and the pins are clearly too proximal, and you have to take your plates over the pin sites because that's just the hand you've been dealt. What do you do? How nervous do you get? What do you tell the patient? What do you do? Um, Matt, we'll start with you. Uh, th I'm going to ask the same question to everybody. <laughs> so get ready for th your answer. Thank you for sending the patient to me. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, I have no problem in that, in that situation. If I totally don't like it, we go to the OR, we take the pins out, I put pins where I like them, and then we wait. So I let that, that old pin site sort of um, defrobest and clear up and let the swelling go down. So if I don't I love it, it's perfect. Thank you. I change everything. So, so, so you want I would, I, would re I would rise their X fix if I didn't like it. If, okay, I would not right. just accept a bad X fix knowing it's going to be a pain in the neck in a week, I would just revise that frame. And, but not be critical of somebody who did that. They did the best they could. I want something different. You change their frame, but talk nicely about them. Yeah, absolutely. So they okay. send me another one. <laughs> that's very, that's so, very kind. So uh, I would do that. Kind. And then um, try to create, the situ uh, create that situation which I want to see in a week. If I don't like what it is today, I'm going to create what I want to see in a week for that later time. So okay. that's where I would begin so that I have that end in mind when I get there. Does okay. that make sense? Final question, just to stay in time. In what clinical situations would you maintain an external fixator after internal fixation to position or distract a joint? Uh, Ahmad, what do you think about that, Dr. Ahmad? I think the, uh, again, I'll just say distal radius fracture with combination of subchondral and then metaphysic loss. You can have your plate go there, it's holding it up well, but the patient needs to make up that bone. If you take the X fix off, they tend to collapse. Okay. Subchondral bone, because there's, there's usually bone loss, there's not much, they have to fill in that whole void. And I, I think if you take that X fix off, the whole corpus tends to, because the lunate pushes it down, it tends to collapse. So okay. I usually leave the frame or that in for at least two or three months. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Pilon, that, that plateau. Case, that case that uh, Susan showed that comes out the front, or I'd leave the frame on. Okay. Very, they very love good. to just sublux right out the front again, even after you fix them. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks, panelists. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.